Today we're going to dive into that sweet, sticky mess of a thing we all villainize at all times called sugar. And more specifically, does sugar turn into fat? So bear with me on this one today. We're going to first dive into a bit of science, how the liver plays a role here, how muscles plays a role here. And then I'm going to end the video on some tips on how I want you to start reframing sugar, how to look at your sugar intake, and how to start slowly becoming aware of how sugar is leading to weight gain or not. In order for us to unpack this, I first want us to actually look at what sugar is. How does sugar function? And understanding the science of it, because the better you understand sugar, the more equipped you are to make better and wiser choices. So, when we eat sugar, it gets converted into glucose. Glucose is a simple sugar molecule. And also, glucose is what fuels most of our cells, and also especially the brain. The brain is very glucose hungry. It needs a lot of glucose to function. Yes, we can use ketones for that when we're on a keto diet, but today's focus, I'm gonna focus on glucose and the role of sugar. Once glucose enters our bloodstream, we release insulin, because insulin sends the signal to the cells to open up to let glucose in. If we didn't have the ability to use insulin, our blood glucose gets higher and higher over time. High blood glucose is very detrimental to our health. However, our body is a very efficient machine. It does not like to waste resources especially something like glucose and energy. Because remember, if you think back for thousands of years, we never knew when our next meal is going to be there. We didn't have Mr. D and Deboniers and Super Spa and Checkers and Hoolies and all these delivery and supermarkets at our fingertips. We had to work daily to get our food. We had to hunt. We had to forage. Sometimes we had food. Sometimes we didn't. So the body is very, very resourceful at conserving energy and storing it for later. That's where sugar needs to be paid attention to. So if we eat a meal that has a lot of carbohydrates in it, the body's gonna try to store some of that glucose it converted into different areas of the body. The first place is gonna be the liver and all our muscle tissue. The liver and the muscles are the two places we can store most of our glucose. And the way it does this, it turns glucose into glycogen. Imagine a tree. A leaf is a single glucose molecule. Now where glycogen is a whole tree, made up of different glucose molecules. And then those trees get stored either in the liver or in our muscle fibers. But the thing is, when the liver and the muscles are saturated, meaning they have reached all the limit they can to store glycogen, now that glucose, we need to find another place to store it. It would have been amazing if we could just urinate it out, but the body doesn't function like that. It wants to store that glucose for later use. So guess what that might be? Unfortunately, fat. So then what the liver does, it takes that additional glucose molecules and it converts them into fatty acids through a process called novolipogenesis. Yes, we always like to use these big words. Novolipogenesis, simply put, converting glucose into fatty acids. The liver will do that the moment our glycogen stores in the liver is full and our glycogen stores in the muscles are full. Then these fatty acids, get neatly packed up into triglycerides and get shuttled throughout the body to be stored in our fat storage areas. Once we've used the glycogen in our muscles, we've used the glycogen in our liver, it can take that fat it's stored to start using that as energy again. It's an amazing system, but the problem is the environment we find ourselves in isn't that amazing anymore for the body we have. Now, the problem becomes with the overconsumption of the sugar. Now, the more sugar we consume, the more insulin we need, the higher our blood glucose becomes, and also then the harder the liver has to work. And the harder the liver has to work, eventually we can even develop fatty liver syndrome outside of alcohol abuse. And also that overconsumption of sugar. If we are already living a sedentary lifestyle, we're not moving, we're not exercising, we are behind a desk the whole time, do you think you're actually ever going to be able to use the glycogen in your muscles? Most likely not. Do you think you're going to really use all the glycogen in your liver? Most likely not either. So where do you think all that excess glucose is going to go to? And then also, with that excess glucose constantly taxing the insulin system, the pancreas, taxing the liver, higher blood glucose overall, diabetes on its way. So then what is the link between sugar and fat? And simply put, overconsumption of energy. The moment we eat sugar and... What I want us to think about energy consumption here, weight gain and weight loss is an energy gain. 
If we consume more energy than the body needs, we will gain weight. If we consume less energy than the body needs, we will lose weight. Now, where does sugar play into this? Sugar is what we sometimes call empty calories. It's not they are empty of energy, they're empty of nutrients. A teaspoon of sugar is around four grams. That four grams is around 16 calories. Now, on average, most people need around 2,000 calories per day to maintain their weight, on average. Now, 16 calories for four grams of sugar sounds like nothing. But how easily does that 16 calories, 10 calories, 20 calories add up during the day? In the coffees, in the teas? Have you ever noticed how we add sugar to almost all foods we buy that's mass-produced? Highly processed foods. But now also to keep in mind here, sugar is glucose and fructose combined. Now, carbohydrates also plays in here. Highly processed white carbs. Those carbs also get converted into glucose in the system. So it's not just the sugar to be wary about, it's the highly processed carbs. And guess what we add to all those highly processed carbs? More sugar. So that four grams of sugar, 16 calories here, 16 calories there, over time, that adds up. Over time, that leads to constant overconsumption. And what do you think that leads to? Over time, the weight slowly keeps going up. Remember when we started this video, I told you, once the glycogen stores are full, it gets converted into fatty acids. That gets shuttled around in triglycerides and gets stored as body fat. But also it gets even a bit more deceiving how sugar reacts to us. If we eat a very high sugary meal or sugary drink, you'll consume that. It has a lot of energy. Blood glucose suddenly spikes, blood glucose suddenly dips, and an hour later, you have cravings, you're hungry, you want something. And what are those cravings generally for? The more unhealthy foods. So we had that blood glucose spike, we converted some of that sugar into fatty acids, and now with that dip in blood glucose, guess what? Cravings. It's one of those cravings where if cannibalism was accepted, you would eat your friend because of that blood glucose spike and dip. These foods that are high in sugar and highly processed, they give us limited satiety. And what do I mean with that? When we eat a highly processed meal that's high in sugar, there's not a lot of nutrients in it. So yes, energy-wise, we're getting enough energy. Nutrient-wise, we're not getting enough. This leads to you eating that high-calorie dense meal, and still, you're not feeling satiated. Still, you are feeling hungry because you're not getting nutrients in it, and your body's gonna make you crave nutrients. And usually then the cravings lead us to, again, the wrong areas of food. This is what we call being full, but not satiated. We're full of energy, but not satiated of nutrients. So we want to eat more. And that eating more leads to more energy intake, more energy intake, more fatty acids, more body weight over time. Also, the more highly processed foods we eat and sugar, the less we eat food that are nutrient dense. Good protein sources, whole grains, fiber, healthy fats. These things satiate us. They send signals to the brain. We had enough. We're getting good food. We can stop eating. Highly processed sugary snacks does exactly the opposite. It sends signal to the brain. Eat more. Keep eating. Because if you think, where in nature do we find foods that are highly processed, high in sugar, very palatable? We don't. So the moment we consume those foods, how hard is it to stop? almost impossible. Then we overeat. Two hours later, we want more. And then that becomes our habit loop. High sugar foods, crash, cravings, high sugar foods, crash, cravings, high sugar food. And that cycle repeats now. And that becomes your habit. What does that do to your liver, your pancreas, and your body fat? So in conclusion, it's not that sugar is the biggest problem. The high consumption of sugar is the problem. Sugar in a healthy diet, there's place for it. If you are active, you are moving, you are stimulating the muscles, you're getting in that 90 to 120 minutes of workout per week, you're moving around during the day, that affords you the luxury to have some form of sugar. But if you have a very sedentary lifestyle, you don't move, you don't exercise or anything, what do you think most of that sugar is going to get converted into? So think of it this way. You need to earn the ability to enjoy your sugar. And how do you earn the ability to enjoy the sugar? By being more active. The more you can deplete your muscle glycogen stores, the more of the sugars you can consume gets converted into glycogen and not fatty acids. Now, the more sedentary you are, 
the more vigilant you need to become. But also remember, the more active we are, the more energy we burn, the more energy we need, the easier it is to lose weight. The less we move, less energy we need, the easier it is for that sugar to lead to overconsumption of energy that leads to increased body weight and blood glucose problems eventually. So the tips here I want you to think about when it comes to sugar, read labels. You'll be surprised where sugar is added to many kinds of foods. I'm gonna challenge you here. Try for the next two, three weeks to keep your sugar intake below 30 grams. It doesn't sound like a lot of sugar, but you'll be surprised how hard it is to be below 30 grams, how sugar is added into everything. Read labels for at least two, three weeks, and you'll be surprised how much you learn where hidden sugars are. Hidden sugars, hidden energy. Remember that. Another one also is just a simple one, but staying hydrated. A lot of times if we are thirsty, we'll crave the sugary snacks. Drink something. 10, 15 minutes later, stop. Are you actually still craving it? Are you hungry? Is that craving now maybe because it's emotional distress? Maybe it's a habit thing? Or it's something you've been avoiding that's creating tension mentally and you want to self-soothe yourself with sugar. Paying attention is very important here. Sugar cravings, you need the awareness to spot where they're coming from. But read the labels, stay hydrated, and start becoming mindful of the cravings. And to close this off, it's not about eliminating sugars completely from your diet. It's becoming aware of where they are, where they are coming from, and how much you're actually consuming. And then tailoring that to how active you are, and the ability to earn your sugar intake. I personally enjoy all these things. And remember, it's not about punishing yourself from day one. Build the foundational knowledge of how food functions, how to slowly change over time, and you'll be surprised six months, eight months down the line how much better you feel and how much better choices you are making. And as always, remember to be better today than you were yesterday. I'm going to ask you a favor. I would really appreciate a thumbs up on this video or a subscribe. That way I know I've helped one person today to become aware of their food choices, to make better educated food choices, and to slowly start taking back their health and becoming a healthier version of themselves.